Good afternoon, calculus students. Um, welcome back after exam one. Uh, exam one's uh, testing window closed yesterday, um, October the 3rd. And I've gotten nearly, in this class, nearly everybody's exam. I think I have all but one or two students who I've gotten their exams from the testing center. So that is an awesome response and have not started to grade them yet. I'm still collecting all exams from all of my classes, so it may be a little bit. Um, don't expect the grade uh, back to you until probably, I would say, the, the end of next week would be when you could expect them back. Uh, when we come back to lecture on Monday, uh, please watch Monday's uh, video, and I'll be sending an email out also over the weekend. But... Um, uh, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about how you could get your test, your actual graded test back uh, if you want it. Um, and we'll, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But I should have them graded by mid to late next week. So um, today what we were going to do is we're going to review uh, section 3.6 on the chain rule. We're going to talk about implicit differentiation, what that means, how to find the derivative um, dy dx uh, if a, an equation is written in, in implicit form. And then we're going to look at our first section on word problems and talk about related rate problems today. And that'll be our first big application section of the semester. Uh, next Monday and Wednesday, on Monday, um, we'll talk about inverse, inverse functions and derivatives and inverse trig functions uh, and their derivatives. And then on Wednesday, We'll look at exponential and log functions uh, and their derivatives. Um, so inverse trig functions and exponential and log functions are good examples of where you see inverse functions used in calculus. And so we'll be looking all next week at inverse functions. Um, I do want to point out that this is kind of a change in the order from your calendar. So we'll, we'll do things a little bit out of order from the calendar, but by the end of next week, we'll be still in the exact same place. Uh, at the end of the week next week. And this does not affect your homework. Uh, as far as what to do, uh, you have homework to do this Friday, uh, October the 6th by midnight, and that covers sections 3, 2, 3, 3, and 3, 6. I do, uh, I have emailed this out to everybody already, but I want to uh, kind of reiterate this to everybody, and I'll probably send another email out soon about it. But I want everybody, when you email your homework to me, I want it emailed as one file and I want it to be a PDF file. So I had uh, several of you email me multiple files uh, last time homework was due, um, and then I had to put them all together as one file myself. Um, I also want it as a PDF file, so be working on how you do that. Um, and remember, there are apps where you can, easy apps where you can take your phone and the camera on your phone and turn it into a scanner and upload things very easily as a single PDF file, if that's what you choose to do. So. Um, one way or another, you need to get everything to me. It's a PDF file, just one PDF file. Problems need to be in order, numerically, and then by section. And then please only turn in the problems that are due for grades. So remember, um, on your syllabus, you have textbook homework out of um, sections 3, 2, 3, 3, and 3, 6. But um, uh, there's also homework to be turned in, which was in a separate part of the syllabus right underneath and only turn in the problems that I'm asking you to turn in, okay? Not, not all the other ones. All right, so I just wanted to kind of go through all that um, and make sure that there was no questions about that. And as always, if you have a question, please either email me or come by during, um, during uh, online office hours and ask me questions about uh, something that you were a little unclear about as far as homework or how something's turned in, or deadlines, or you know, just in general how the course is being run. All right, so um, today, uh, first of all, we're talking about um, the chain rule. And um, a little bit, <clears throat> going back and doing a little bit of reviewing about the chain rule, and then after that, uh, we're going to look at implicit differentiation. So the chain rule remember, is a way of uh, finding a derivative of a function written as a composition function. Um, so it, uh, the chain rule gives 
us a way to um, calculate the derivative of a function, well, let's just put it, of a composition function. I'll just say it that way. And so a composition function, remember, we're talking about a function of a function, right? So anytime you have something that is a function of a function, then the chain rule is, is coming into play when you're trying to calculate the derivative of that function. All right. So two ways we could write this out. One way was with prime notation. If f of x could be written as g of h of x, then um, f prime of x is equal to g prime of h of x times h prime of x. And uh, if you'll remember, you know, uh, the way I talked about this in class, I, I talked about um, the g being the outside function and h being the inside function. And so then notice this is g prime of h of x. So this is the derivative of the outside function. And then h prime is the derivative of the inside function. All right, so it's the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside is the way I kind of referred to it. Now in differential, so that's with prime notation. In differential notation, the chain rule looks like this. The dy dx is equal to dy du times du dx. Right, that's a differential form for the chain rule. Right, and what is this saying? This is saying that y is some function of x um, and that y is a function of u. So that statement, remember, means that y is some function of u and this is saying du dx is saying that u is some function of x and so what do you have here that if y is some function of u and u is some function of x then substituting h of x in place of u um, you get that y is g of h of x. So you get the exact same statement as we had above uh, for the derivative. Uh, as far as, you know, it, these are equivalent. They mean the same thing, it's just different ways of writing it. Uh, for those of you going on to Cal 3, especially that second way, the differential way of writing uh, the chain rule is going to be very important to you as you look at more complicated versions of the chain rule. Okay. So some examples for the chain rule uh, to go back and review. So examples of the chain rule. All right, so if we have uh, f of x is equal to um, 1 minus x cubed all raised to the seventh power, Right, that would be a classic example of a chain rule problem that's just uh, a power rule. Uh, problem. This is the seventh power, seventh degree power function of the one minus x cubed function. And so f prime of x would be the derivative of the outside. So that's the derivative of the power function. So that'd be seven times something to the sixth power. And the something is the inside function. It doesn't change in that step. And then that would be multiplied by the derivative of the inside function, which is negative three x squared. So f prime of x would be equal to, simplifying this a little bit, be negative 21 x squared times 1 minus x cubed to the sixth power. And that would be our derivative. All right? Uh, f of x, let's see, let's, next example, g of x is equal to um, sine uh, to the fifth power of x. Sine to the fifth power of x. Now that sine to the fifth power of x is just an abbreviation, remember. It's an accepted abbreviation. Technically, probably not a very good form to write uh, for a power. 
because uh, for most other functions, we don't really observe that we could do that and write a power of a function that way. But it's a pretty accepted abbreviation. But remember, this is an abbreviation for sine of x to the fifth power, but those mean the same thing. So this is very similar to the problem above. It's a fifth degree power function of the sine function. And so g prime of x would be the derivative of the outside. So that would be the derivative of the power function. So it'd be five times something to the fourth power. And the something is that inside function, which doesn't change in that step. And then that would be times the derivative of the inside function. And the derivative of sine x is cosine x. And so g prime of x is 5, um, and probably the way you'd mostly see it written is 5 sine to the 4th times cosine, like that. Okay, um, let's say we have uh, h of x is equal to uh, the tangent of um, 5x to the 4th minus 1. So in this case, the um, outside function is the tangent function, and the inside function is the 5x to the 4th minus 1 function. And so h prime of x here would be the derivative of the outside function, the derivative of the tangent, which is secant squared. And so it'd be secant squared. That's the derivative of the outside function of 5x to the 4th minus 1. The inside function doesn't change there. And then that would be multiplied by the derivative of the inside function, which would be 20x cubed. Remember the derivative of the tangent. So remember here, and we're using this in this step, remember that um, the derivative of the tangent function is the square of the secant function. And so that's what we're using there to take the derivative of the outside, right? The derivative of the tangent is the square of the secant, like that. All right, so, you know, I kind of wanted to go back through, well, let, I tell you what, let's look at one more example. And then we'll finish that up. So um, let's say we have uh, f of x is um, cosine cubed of sine of um, x squared, like that. So this is a little bit trickier of a function because this is actually uh, several levels here. And so the ch this is the chain rule applied multiple times. So the levels to this are is that the outside function, and be careful here, this is cosine of sine of x squared and this is quantity cubed. That's what that three means on the cosine right there. And so the levels here is that this is first a cube, like that. That's our outside function. And then the next function is the cosine function. And then the next function after that is the cosine of the sine. So the next one would be the sine function. And finally, the x squared function. So this would be the cube function of the cosine function, of the sine function, of the x squared function, of the square function. Right? So multiple levels for the chain rule here to find this derivative. f prime of x would be, first of all, the derivative of the outside function. And so you know that would be um, uh, the power function, the derivative of the cube function. And so this would be 3 cosine squared of, and the inside piece stays the same right here. So there's our derivative of the outside, right? And so we've taken the derivative of the cube function. I'll check them off as we go through that. And now this is times the derivative of the cosine function. So this is the cosine of the sine. And so the derivative of the cosine is negative sine of the sine function. Again, the inside function here does not change. So that's our next level. Check, I've done the derivative of the cosine. Now times the derivative, and I have to kind of carry this over to the next line here, times the derivative of the sine. So this is the sine of x squared. So the derivative of sine would be cosine of x squared. And again, the inside piece does not uh, change in that uh, composition function. 
And then finally times the derivative of the very inside piece there, the x squared, the square function, which would be 2x. So it's, that's tricky. Uh, definitely have to kind of keep things straight. And I've taken care of all four of those functions there. Kind of cleaning this up a little bit. You wouldn't want to really leave it like that. So let's see, I have a 3 and a 2 and a negative 1. So that would be negative 6. And I have an x as a factor. And then um, cosine squared of sine of x squared. Right, and then that would be multiplied by um, the, and I maybe put multiplication symbols in here to kind of separate things a little bit, times the sine of the sine of x squared. Got that taken care of, and then finally times the cosine of x squared. So definitely um, a kind of a tricky problem as far as calculating the derivative there. All right, so that's a brief rundown of the uh, chain rule. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to implicit differentiation. So um, this finishes the chain rule for us. And using the chain rule to calculate derivatives of composition functions. And so now we move on um, to implicit differentiation. All right, so um, one way to look at this is we move into implicit differentiation. And so far, what we've done is we have learned how to calculate uh, functions that are written in explicit form. Now, explicit form means that y is written as a function of x, that you have a, you have a dependent variable and it's a function of an independent variable. So you have y as a function of x, right? So you've got y, it's the equation solve for y. So you might have y as a function of x, you might have s as a function of t, Right, that in, in every case that the function is solved for a variable. So, like if you have f of x equals uh, x cubed plus x squared minus 2, right, what do you have here? You have that y is explicitly written out as a function of x. Right, y is written in terms of x there, um, like we've got right there. Um, if you had a, a uh, Position function for a vertical motion problem. We had uh, s of t is negative 16 t squared minus 32 t plus 100. Right? What do we have here? That s the position is written as a function of t. Uh, s might in with vertical motion that might be written as h, possibly as for height. But the point here is that you've got um, you know what are you going to do? You're going to find ds dt in this problem. You're going to find the derivative of s with respect to t. On this problem, you're going to find dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x. Um, every problem we've talked about where we've calculated a derivative, they've all been written in what we call explicit form. They've all been a independent variable is a uh, or a dependent variable is a function of an independent variable. All right. So um, what we're going to do today is look at how you might calculate. Um, derivatives if it if the functions or the equations not written in explicit form so um, I had a brief uh, interruption there so uh, so what we're going to do is look at how to find derivatives of functions that are in implicit form now uh, another way to kind of think about this is if we're talking about functions everything we've done so far uh, so far all graphs that we've looked at have passed the vertical line test, right? When you write an equation in explicit form, like the ones that I've talked about here, well, all the graphs of all those functions pass the vertical line test. You know, you don't have any plus or minuses on a radical or anything like that. So a function that's written in explicit form like that is going to pass the typically going to pass the vertical line test. So what happens? You know, uh, what happens if you have a graph? 
and there's lots of applications where this might be true, where the graph itself does not pass the vertical line test. So just for example, Okay, so what if we have a graph that does not pass the vertical line test that's a, um, um, maybe something like this. That, and there are lots of applications where the graph that we're talking about does not pass the vertical line test. So let's say we have a graph that looks like that. Now there's actually lots of wheel kind of problems, W-H-E-E-L, uh, where you might get graphs that look something like this. Uh, in the application, but what if we want to still find the slope of the tangent line in graphs like that? Well, you know, an equation like this can't be written in explicit form, or a graph like this can't be written with an equation that's in explicit form. Now, it might be able to, you might be able to take it and write it in two pieces that are explicit. Even in, the, even in that case, this one probably would not work that way, but, but, um, but the entire graph itself couldn't be written in explicit form. And so what happens when you have an equation that's not in, um, in that uh, implicit, not in that explicit form? So now, you know, once again, here, I'll hold on real quick. Uh, once again, if we have an equation like this, y equals x cubed plus x squared plus 1, right, that's an explicit form. But an equation like this one, uh, x cubed plus y cubed equals 8, that's in what we call implicit form. It is not solved for y. Right? This one is solved for y. This one's not solved for y. Now, um, that second equation, you could solve that one for y actually relatively easily and write it in explicit form. But we will, um, so that one's solvable for y. So we could write that. And that would be a strategy we could use there if we wanted to find dy dx, is that that equation is solvable for y. But this equation, um, x cubed y squared plus 2y cubed plus y equals 10, that one is probably not solvable for y. If it was, so, uh, it would be very difficult to do. So probably not solvable for y, or at least not practically solvable for y. So those are the kinds of equations where we want to investigate how do you still find dy dx, right? And so we'll start with the easier of those two problems right there. We're going to start with x cubed plus y cubed equals 8. And we're going to actually do this problem two ways and show you that you get the same result regardless of which way you do the problem. Um, so how do we find uh, dy dx for this problem? Well, one way would be just to solve it for y. So, uh, so this is the first way to do the problem. Uh, that's supposed to be a 1 there. Uh, so, so we could solve for y. So we get the y by itself by subtracting x cubed. And then taking the cube root of both sides of the equation, that's not a big deal. And boom, we've got the equation solved for y, right? And you've got, you know, you could write this with an exponent like that. This is actually a chain rule problem, right? And we could find dy dx uh, by using the chain rule. dy dx would be derivative of the outside function, so that'd be one third times eight minus x cubed to the negative two-thirds, right, that would be the derivative of the outside function. Remember, you subtract one from the exponent. So one-third minus one is negative two-thirds, right? And then you multiply that by the derivative of the inside function, which is negative three x squared, right? The uh, threes cancel, and you'd end up with dy dx equals, and we would have a negative x squared in the numerator, and in the denominator, we'd have 8 minus x cubed to the 2 thirds power. Or um, one way you could write that uh, if you wanted to, and I'll show you why I'm writing it that way in a few minutes. You could write the, the 2 thirds power, you know, that, that 3 in the denominator is a cube root. So this is technically the cube root of 8 minus x cubed 
and that's squared, like that. All right, so that, that's the same denominator right there. All right, another way. So a second way to do this problem, another way, is to use the process that we call implicit differentiation. And with implicit differentiation, what you do is you start out the problem by assuming uh, y is some function of x. Some uh, function of x. You just don't know what it is. So we're so going to assume what y, that y is some function of x, and then so then we've got x cubed plus y cubed, and this y right here, I'm going to put it in brackets. It's some function of x, I just don't know what it is. All right, and so what we're going to do is we're going to differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to x. So I'm d differentiating this side of the equation. I'm going to put brackets around the entire side of the equation, and I'm taking the derivative of this side with respect to x. Now on the left side, then this would be the derivative of each of these terms. And on the right side, well, that's easy. The derivative of 8 is just 0 with respect to x. <clears throat> All right, so now what have we got here? We've got the first term, the derivative of x cubed with respect to x. Well, that's just 3x squared. That's just a power rule problem. But the second one, this is the derivative with respect to x of y cubed. And remember, y we're assuming is some function of x. So you could think of that y cubed if you wanted to. I'm going to write this off to the side. We're typically not going to write it out this way, but you could think of this as some function of x cubed. And so how do you find the derivative of a function of x uh, raised to a power like that? Well, you use the chain rule. This is a chain rule problem. And so the derivative of the outside here would be 3 times y to the second power. That's the derivative of the outside of that function. And then the derivative of the inside of that function, well, the, the y is, we're assuming is some function of x. We just don't know what the, what the function is. And so all we can do to find that or to write that derivative is just write it as the derivative of y with respect to x. That would be the derivative of the inside. And that, that's equal to 0. And now what you do, okay, so this is the first step. The first step is assume y is a function of x, differentiate every term, both sides of the equation, with respect to x. And remember that anytime you see a y, you're assuming that that y is some function of x. So you have to use the chain rule when you've got a y like that. Um, and so now what we do is we solve, remember we were after dy dx, that, you know, that's, that's the premise of this whole process is to find dy dx, so what we're going to do is solve for dy dx. So to solve for dy dx, we'd subtract um, 3x squared, so you'd have 3y squared dy dx is equal to negative 3x squared, and then you divide by 3y squared and dy dx would be, the threes would cancel notice, and you'd get the negative of x squared over y squared. Now what I want you to do is I want you to compare um, compare uh, our answer here, where we get negative x squared over y squared, and the answer we got the first way we did this problem. And I want you to see that they're really the same thing. Because notice that uh, the answer we got the first way we did the problem was negative x squared over the cube root of 8 minus x cubed squared. But what is the cube root of 8 minus x cubed? Um, if you look right here, that's equal to y. So if you substituted y in there, notice you would get negative x squared over y squared. You get the exact same derivative, just get it in a slightly different form. You, you get it in terms of x and y rather than just as a function of x. You know, if you're going to evaluate this derivative to find the slope of a tangent line, presumably you'd have both the x and y coordinates, so you could use that form. So notice we get a form that's equivalent. Um, 
And uh, so we've got this new process now where we can calculate derivatives. So, so uh, even if the functions written or the equations written in implicit form. Now that this problem that we just looked at here on this page, we could have solved for y. Uh, so now let's look um, at a problem where solving, whoops, uh, solving for y is not on the table at all. So let's say we have this function or this equation, x to the fourth plus 3y to the sixth plus y squared equals 10. Now this equation, first of all, is in implicit form. Right, it is not solved for y. So that's an implicit form, and it's not solvable for y. Or at least not, not from a practical standpoint, it's not solvable for y. So uh, what are we going to do here is we're going to um, use this process of implicit differentiation to... Um, calculate dy dx. So we use implicit differentiation to find dy dx. Okay, so uh, what are we going to do here? We're going to calculate the derivative of both sides of this equation. And I'm going to emphasize that we're doing that by putting brackets around both sides in emphasizing that we're differentiating both sides of this equation with respect to x. Okay, we're assuming here that if two, function, two things are equal, that their derivatives have to be equal also. So um, on the left side of the equation, what are we doing here? We're calculating the derivative of each of these terms separately. So the derivative of x to the fourth with respect to x plus the derivative of 3y to the sixth with respect to x plus the derivative of y squared with respect to x equals, and then on the right side of the equation, the derivative of 10 with respect to x is 0. So I'll just go ahead and write 0. Now notice that um, anytime you have a y in there, then you're thinking chain rule for how you're going to um, calculate the derivative. Let me clean this last term up just a little bit. Okay. So, um, so how are we going to go about doing that? Um, you know, how do we evaluate each derivative? The derivative of x to the fourth with respect to x would be 4x cubed. The derivative of 3y to the sixth with respect to x, this is a chain rule problem, right? So you have to use the chain rule here. And so to use the chain rule, the derivative of the outside would be 18y to the fifth. Remember what we're doing, we're assuming assuming y is a function of x. Assume y is some function of x. You just don't know what it is. So that, that 18y to the fifth is the derivative of the outside, and then the derivative of the inside would be the derivative of y with respect to x, which we just write as dy dx. That third term would be exactly the same thing. The derivative of the outside would be 2y, that's the power rule, and then the derivative of the inside would be the derivative of y with respect to x, which would be dy dx. And then that would be equal to 0 on the other side of the equation. Now notice on, uh, on this equation, once we've differentiated everything with respect to x, we still have, um, we, we have two dy dx terms. So you have a little bit more algebra to do here. So now solve for dy dx. So let's see how we're going to do that. Um, first of all, notice that the, uh, the 4x cubed is not a dy dx term, so I would put that on the other side of the equation, subtract 4x cubed. And then the other two terms are dy dx terms, so I would factor dy dx out of those two terms and that would leave me with 18y to the fifth plus 2y, like that. And there, you've got it, just about. You just solve for dy dx, so you divide both sides by that expression in the brackets. And sure enough, 
we found dy dx. There's a function of both x and y, that's okay. That's not a problem to do that. All right, so um, hopefully there's no questions there. Uh, let's look at our next problem. Um, so let's see, and, and I, I'm probably going to need a little bit of room here, so I'm going to go on to the next problem. Uh, and in this equation, I have x squared y plus uh, x y cubed equals negative 2, we'll say. All right, so this is definitely an implicit differentiation problem. This is not solved for y. And so implicit differentiation is definitely the method we're going to use here. Uh, I really don't have much of an option. Solving this for y is not going to be an easy uh, process to do. I might be able to solve it for y in terms of x, but it's going to be a difficult and not practical thing to do. All right, so now I differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to x. Now I'm going to stop writing this step out after this problem. You know, we know that that's what we're doing. We're differentiating both sides of this equation with respect to x. And on the left side of the equation, what are we going to do there? We're going to take the derivative of each term separately with respect to x. And again, on the right side, you get 0. The derivative of negative 2 with respect to x is 0. That's not always the case where you get 0 on the right side of the equation. It's common to write it that way, but you don't definitely don't always see it that way. So just kind of point that out. All right, so on the, um, on the left side there, the problem here is that this is the derivative of a product. And so this has got to be the product rule right here. Uh, don't overlook the product rule and the quotient rule, you know, all those rules that we've talked about um, for differentiation still certainly are governing what we do. And so both of these are derivatives of multiplication problems, and so they're both product rule problems. So the first one, the derivative of x squared y would be the first factor times the derivative of the second factor, but the derivative of y with respect to x would just be dy dx plus the second factor times the derivative of the first but the, the derivative of x squared is that's explicit so that's just 2x times y. So there's the product rule on the first term. And then on the second term go through the same process it'd be the first factor times the derivative of the second factor so the derivative of y cubed would be a chain rule problem. And so this would be 3y squared, that would be the derivative of the outside, times the derivative of the inside. Remember, we're assuming y is a function of x. So the derivative of the inside, the derivative of that y with respect to x would just be dy dx. So that's my first times the derivative of the second. And then that would be plus the second times the derivative of the first, but the derivative of x is 1. So you just have 1 times y cubed, and then that's equal to 0. Okay, so then we're going to clean this up a little bit. So you have x squared dy dx, there's a dy dx term, plus 2xy, that's a term that's not a dy dx term, plus 3xy squared, another dy dx term, plus y cubed equals 0. So now the, the process here is to take the two terms that are not dy dx terms and move them to the other side of the equation, right? In this case, subtract both of them. And then that will leave me with terms that are just dy dx terms. And I factor out the dy dx out of those two terms. And that will leave me with an x squared plus a 3xy uh, squared. Close the brackets off. Move the other two terms to the other side of the equation, you have negative y cubed minus 2xy. Okay, and then um, finally divide by what's in brackets. And so you'd have negative y cubed uh, minus 2xy 
divided by x squared plus 3x uh, y squared. You might certainly try to factor and see if you can simplify the expression at the end. Uh, algebraically, I could take out a negative y out of the numerator, and that would leave you with y squared plus 2x. In the denominator, I could take out an x, uh, and that would leave you with x plus 3y squared, but there would be nothing to, that I could simplify there. So, you know, so factoring is not a bad thing to do there, to, to write it out a little bit different, uh, in a little bit nicer of a form. In this case, it didn't help us simplify the, fra <clears throat> the fraction at all. <clears throat> all right. So what we're doing right now is just working through some examples uh, to make sure that you see plenty of different kinds of situations for implicit differentiation. All right, so our next problem. Um, let's look at something with some trig functions in it this time. So let's say we have 4 cosine x sine y equals 1. 4 cosine x sine y equals 1. All right, so... Uh, definitely not solve for y. This one probably you could solve for y. Um, it would involve an inverse trig function, which we haven't talked much, we haven't talked at all about. Uh, we won't do that until next week. Um, but rather than going that route, let's just use implicit differentiation to, to find the derivative. And in this case, this is a multiplication problem. We could look at this as 4 cosine x times sine y, and so this would be a product rule problem. Okay, so we would uh, use the product rule here. We'd have the first factor, 4 cosine x, times the derivative of sine y. Now be careful here. <clears throat> this is the sine function of the y function. That's a chain rule problem because the y function is some function of x. Right? You could think of that as sine of f of x, where you don't, just don't know what f of x is. So the chain rule would say that that's the derivative of the outside function, so that would be cosine of y, the inside function doesn't change there, times the derivative of the inside function and the derivative of y would be dy dx. By the way, in some books, uh, some instructors, some professors will use, instead of dy dx there, they'll use y prime. Uh, I never use prime notation here because it just gets too confusing with exponents. And so I always use the differential notation when I'm using implicit differentiation. Okay, so that's the first factor times the derivative of the second factor. And the derivative of the second factor was a chain rule problem. And then that would be plus the second factor times the derivative of the first factor, but the derivative of 4 cosine x would be negative 4 sine x, and then that would be times sine y. And then that would be equal to 0. Okay, so... Um, this is 4 cosine x cosine y dy dx minus 4 sine x sine y is equal to 0. So this one's not too bad as far as solving for dy dx. You have 4 cosine x cosine y uh, dy dx is equal to 4 sine x sine y. You just add that term to both sides. And then divide both sides by 4 cosine x cosine y. So you get dy dx is equal to um, 4 sine x sine y divided by 4 cosine x <coughs> cosine y. And notice that the uh, fours divide out, and then you have, you know, you have sine x over cosine x, which would be tangent x, and then you have sine y over cosine y, which would be tangent y. All right, and so that would be our derivative. All right. Um, so let's see the. Um, Let's say that we have um, we have. Uh, let's find the slope of the tangent line in this problem. 
You want to find the slope of the tangent at the point Let's see, so let's use the x value um, pi over 3, and we'll, we'll, we'll calculate what the y value has to be. Okay, so, um, so we take our equation for cosine x sine y equals 1. We substitute pi over 3 in place of x. So pi over 3 is, uh, cosine of pi over 3, rather, is 1 half, so you have 4 times one-half times sine y equals one. And so four times one-half is two, so you get two sine y equals one, sine y equals one-half, and if we're talking about quadrant one angle, so let's just talk about that restriction that it's quadrant one angle, then the sine is equal to one-half at pi over six. Sine of pi over six is equal to one-half. So this is going to be pi over 6 right here. And so, there you go. We're trying to find the slope of the tangent at the point pi over 3, pi over 6. So what do we do here? We take uh, our derivative, dy dx, that we just calculated, and we would evaluate it at this point, pi over 3, pi over 6. So notice in this case, we need both the x and the y values to calculate this derivative. And so this would be the tangent of pi over 3, times the tangent of pi over 6, like that. So the tangent of pi over 3 is the um, square root of 3. The tangent of pi over 6 is the square root of 3 over 3. And so you end up with um, 1, interestingly, as the when you multiply all that out. And so the slope of the tangent line at that point is, is equal to 1. All right, so that sounds good. All right, let's look at uh, another problem. All right. So uh, let's say we have this equation, x, sorry, another example, x cosine y equals 1. And let's find the equation of the tangent line. Find the equation of the tangent. at the point uh, 2 pi over 3. And again, you could you could substitute 2 and pi over 3 in there um, to uh, make sure that that equation actually goes through the point 2 pi over 3, but it does. So first find dy dx. Now we could solve this for y again, uh, but it would involve the inverse cosine function, which we, we don't know how to differentiate at this point. So we're not going to go about that route. We're going to instead use implicit differentiation. All right, so uh, this would be a product rule problem. So, so we have to use the product rule. All right. So let's see, this would be the first factor times the derivative of the second. Okay, so cosine of y is the cosine function of the y function. So the derivative of the outside would be negative sine of y times the derivative of the inside function. So the derivative of y would be dy dx. So the first times the derivative of the second, so the derivative of cosine y is negative sine y, that's the derivative of the outside, times the derivative of the inside, which would be dy dx, plus the second times the derivative of the first, but the derivative of x is 1 with respect to x, whoops, and then you'd have the derivative on the um, right side of the equation is 0. Okay, so this is our this is our equation. We get negative x sine y dy dx uh, plus cosine y equals zero. And then we solve for um, dy dx. Now, technically, since you have the point, you really wouldn't need to solve it for dy dx at this point if you didn't want to. But I'll go ahead and do that. So you have negative x sine y dy dx is equal to negative cosine y and then divide both sides by um, 
uh, negative x sine y and you get the dy dx is equal to cosine y over x sine y. Now I could write that as cotangent, but you know I'm everybody's more familiar with the sine and the cosine, so I would just leave it like that probably when we're evaluating it. So now we find the slope of the tangent. All right, so to find the slope of the tangent, um, we would take dy dx and we'd evaluate it at the point 2 pi over 3. So let's see, so that would be cosine of pi over 3 over 2 times sine of pi over 3. So the cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half, and the sine of pi over 3 is also 1 half. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not. It, that's uh, I lied. It's square root of 3 over 2. Let's clean this up a little bit. So this is 1 half, and then sine of pi over 3 is the square root of 3 over 2. And so you'd get, um, you know, these twos divide out right here. So you'd have 1 half over the square root of 3, or 1 over 2 square root of 3, like that. Or if you wanted to, you could really you could rationalize it by multiplying by the square root of three over the square root of three, and you get the square root of three over six, and that would be our slope of the tangent. And so then use uh, point slope to write the equation. So you'd have y minus y one. That's pi over three equals the slope. Whoops. y minus pi over 3 equals the slope, which is square root of 3 over 6 times x minus 2, like that. And then you could clean it up from there, which I'll let you do, but you could solve it for y and clean it up. So now clean this up a little, at least. All right. So we've worked through some problems now that involve um, differentiating functions that are written in implicit form, that where it's an implied function of a variable. And so now we're going to uh, look at an application for the rest of class today, a type of application that relies on uh, implicit differentiation. And so this is uh, related rates. So in our textbook, that we're using in the OpenStax textbook. This is in section 4.1. And this, the title is Related Rate Problems. Um, and this is an application that involves implicit differentiation. So that involves uh, implicit differentiation. Okay. So let's talk about uh, how this is going to kind of work out. So first of all, um, a rate, so if we're talking about related rates, we've got that word rate in there. A rate is a derivative uh, with respect to time. Right? And for these kinds of problems, we're talking about it being with respect to time. So, for example, dx dt is, um, you're saying that x is, whoa, sorry, dx dt, that's better. Uh, you're saying that x is changing uh, with respect to time. And you're also saying that x is a function of time. So whatever x represents, it's changing with respect to time, and it's some function of time. If dx dt is positive, so that would say that x is getting bigger. as time increases.
And if dx dt is less than zero, if dx dt is negative, then x is getting smaller. as time increases. So that's important when we're talking about um, uh, related rate problems, certainly. And now you've got this word related in there. So the deal is this. Uh, we are um, going to write equations that relate two or more rates uh, to each other. So, so a related rate is an equation where we're taking several rates and trying to relate them to each other. So that's so the question is how do you go about doing that? And how do you use that to solve a related rate problem? All right, so probably looks somewhat confusing at this point, which I would understand. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write down a method for solving related rate problems, and then we're going to actually apply this method in several problems. Um, so solving a related rate problem. One, write down every rate uh, that's given in the problem. So sum will be known and sum will be unknown. So some rates you'll know and some rates you won't know in the problem. So when I talk about rates, we're talking about things like dx, dt, uh, dy, whoops, dy, dt, ds, dt, you know, da, dt. These are all variables that are connected to time somehow. All right, step two. Uh, write an equation that relates the variables in the problem. Not the rates, but that relates the variables in the problem. Whatever variables that you've got going on in the problem, you want to write an equation that involves those variables. Three, you're going to assume uh, these variables are all functions of time. They're changing over time. So what are we going to do? If we assume these variables are all functions of time, then we're going to differentiate the equation from number two. So differentiate the equation from number two. Uh, with respect to time. And how are you going to do that? Well, time, in fact, will not be a variable in the problem. And so this is where implicit differentiation comes in. In these problems, every variable is implicit. Because they're all functions of time. They're all functions of a variable that's not even in the problem. And so they're all going to be implicit differentiation problems. Alright, so once you've differentiated the equation, you substitute, substitute all known quantities, oops, uh, known quantities and rates. And then finally, 
fifth thing, uh, solve for the unknown rate. So we're going to solve for the unknown rate. All right, so um, we're going to look at a problem, and we're going to use these steps and see if we can walk through how to solve this problem. All right, so this is our example, kind of an introductory example. We're going to drop a rock uh, into a pond. You know, and if you um, if you drop a rock into a pond, what's going to happen? There's this circular ripple that starts expanding away from where you dropped it. So this is a circular, uh, circular ripple um, moves away from the point of contact. Um, at, and we're going to say at 5 centimeters per second. So notice that 5 centimeters per second is a rate, right? Um, and the question is, find the rate um, at which the area of the circle Um, is expanding of the circular, uh, well, uh, let's say find the rate at which the area of the circular circular uh, ripple, we'll say it that way, a little, makes a little bit more sense. Find the rate at which the area of the circular ripple is expanding um, when t is equal to 4, in other words, at 4 seconds, 4 seconds after the rock hits the water. All right, so what happens? You, you've got a um, point of contact. I'll make it that dot right there. And then you have the circular ripple that expands away from that uh, point of contact. All right, and so that's the ripple right there. And that would be the radius of that ripple. And what's happening? I'm going to put an arrow there because that radius is expanding. And you're told that the radius is expanding or that the radius is getting bigger at a rate of 5 centimeters per second. So that tells us the dr dt is 5. That's the rate of change of radius with respect to time. Technically 5 centimeters per second. And then what are we being asked to do here? We're being asked to find the rate at which the area of that circle is expanding. So what we're being asked to find here is dA dt. That's our unknown rate in the problem. We know that the rate is uh, dr dt, the rate at which radius is expanding is 5. dA dt is what we're trying to find in the problem. Alright, so our directions that we just wrote down on the previous page were that uh, once you've identified all the the rates in the problem, the known and unknown rates, you want, you want to write an equation that involves the variables in the problem. Well, the variables in the problem are A and R, and so that's easy. The equation that relates A and R is just the area of a circle. A is equal to pi R squared. There's our, our equation that relates the variables to each other. And now what we do is we take that equation and we differentiate both sides with respect to time. Now neither of those variables has a t in it, or you know, there's no t in there anywhere, and so what are you saying here is that both of those variables are implicitly functions of time. They are not explicit variables, they're implicit variables. And so this is a place where, in, in this kind of problem, where we use implicit differentiation on every variable, because these are all um, assumed to be some functions of time here. So the derivative of a with respect to t is simply dA dt. And the derivative of r squared with respect to t, that would be a chain rule problem. And so the derivative of the outside would be 2r 
and then the derivative of the inside would be dr dt. Oh, and, um, and I forgot the pi in there also, so that should be a pi stuck in there, and there should be a pi in here also. I knew something didn't look quite right, and so there should be a pi in here also. There we go. So, uh, so you had areas pi r squared, so the derivative of the, the pi is a constant that just comes down for the ride, and so you're just taking the derivative of r squared, which is 2r dr dt. Okay, so that's better. And so now what you do, you've got an equation that relates the rates to each other, right? That's why it's called a related rate problem. This equation relates the rates that are in the problem. And now you substitute everything that you know here and to find dA dt. So dA dt is equal to 2 pi times the radius. Now notice that the, um, that the radius, uh, what is the radius in this case? Well, you know that dr dt is 5 centimeters per second. So you know the dr dt is 5 centimeters per second. You know that the time is 4, and so the radius would have to be, after, after 4 seconds, the radius would have to just be 5 times 4, or 20 centimeters. And so that's what gets substituted in here for radius is 20 centimeters. And then dr dt, would be um, five centimeters per second. Five centimeters per second like that. All right, and so, um, what happens here? We have dA dt, do the arithmetic here, would be uh, 200 pi, So you'd have 200 pi, and then this would be centimeters times centimeters. Let's see how the units work out here. It would be centimeters squared per second, which makes sense that the, the rate of change of area should be in square centimeters per second. And so that would be how fast the rate, the area of that circle is changing at the four second mark. Right, it would be 200 pi square centimeters per second. All right, and which is, you know, by the way, well over 600 square centimeters per second. So it's, you know, the area, maybe that might be a little bit unexpected. The radius is only changing at five centimeters per second. The area is changing at 200 or almost, or over 600 square centimeters per second. All right, so let's uh, look at another problem. So that's our first related rate problem. Related rate problems frequently have a lot to do with geometry. So in this next example, we're inflating a spherical balloon. All right, uh, the volume of the balloon uh, is increasing Uh, at 800 cubic centimeters per minute. So the question is, how fast, so when you see how fast, you're talking about a rate, how fast is radius increasing uh, when R is equal to 30 centimeters. All right, so in this particular problem, we would write down the rates that we've, we've got in the problem. So um, now uh, the volume of the balloon is increasing at 800 cubic centimeters per minute. So that would mean dV dt is 800. That's the rate of change of volume with respect to time. And then we are being asked how, the, how fast the radius is increasing, and so dr dt is our unknown rate in this problem. All right, and then r would be 30. 
All right, now um, the volume of a sphere I'm, this is not a formula. It's a formula that I hope you know, but I'm not going to require that you know it for a test. Uh, so if this is a formula that you would need on a test, I would give it to you. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. All right, so that would be our equation that relates the variables in the problem. And so then what do we do here? We differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to t. So we're differentiating v with respect to t. And on the other side of the equation, we're di differentiating uh, 4 thirds pi r cubed. Let's see if I can remember to keep the pi in there this time. <clears throat> now the left side of the equation, that's just dv dt. On the right side, you know the 4 thirds pi is a constant. And what you're doing here is you're taking the derivative of r cubed with respect to t. And that's where implicit differentiation would come into play because r is implicitly, it's implied to be a function of time. It's not explicitly written out that way. And so dv dt would be 4 thirds pi times 3r squared dr dt. The derivative of the outside there would be 3r squared and then the derivative of the inside would be um, the dr dt. Now notice the threes divide out right there, well, that's nice. And so dv dt would be 4 pi r squared dr dt. 4 pi r squared dr dt. And that's the equation that relates the rates to each other. <clears throat> All right. And now what are we going to do here at this point in the problem is we are going to, um, you know, dr dt is what we're trying to find. And you can, you can solve for dr dt if you want first. That would be okay. Uh, so dr dt would be 1 over 4 pi r squared dv dt. And so then substitute the information that you've got here. So uh, dr dt is our unknown. Uh, 1 over 4 pi times r squared, which would be 30 squared like that, and then that would be times uh, dv dt, which is 800, like so. So dr dt would be, let's see, that 30 squared is 900 uh, times 4 would be 3600 pi in the denominator, 1 over 3600 pi, and then this would be times 800 right here. And so dr dt would be 800 over 3600 pi. And uh, you know all the units cancel out, and this, this should just be in centimeters. You should always kind of check that to make sure that the units are canceling like you think they're going to cancel. But you should be left with just centimeters there because it's the rate of, ch uh, I'm sorry, centimeters per second. Um, and then the, uh, let's see, the 800 over 3600, you could divide out a 400 there. And so this will leave you with 2 over 9 pi uh, centimeters. And I said seconds, but this should be minutes, centimeters per minute, because this, is, this problem was done in minutes. So two, 2 over 9 pi centimeters per minute would be the rate of change of radius, which I think is, by the way, about 0.07 centimeters per minute. So even though the volume is increasing pretty fast, the um, it seems like at least the radius is not changing very fast at all in this problem. And you know you may have had that experience before where you're blowing up a balloon and what happens as you continue to blow up the balloon, the um, it seems like the, the rate of change of the size of that balloon is slowing down even though you're still blowing into the balloon just the same same um, force and it's just not it's just slowing down uh, and that has to do with the volume of the sphere so all right um, so let's say let's um, finish this uh, these problems let's see let's look at a, a problem out of the textbook um, to finish up 
related rates and talking about related rates. So we're in section 4.1 in your textbook. And in section 4.1, uh, these problems are on um, page pages 356 through 358. And so let's look at a um, example. Um, on uh, this is on page 357, problem number 38. Okay, so this is page 357. Uh, section 4.1 of your book, and this is problem number 38. It says, you stand 40 feet from a bottle rocket on the ground and watch as it takes off vertically into the air at a rate of 20 feet per second. All right, so let's just draw that out. You're 40 feet from a bottle rocket that's on the ground. So let's say that the rocket is right here. So it launches vertically. And we all know that's not really practical. The bottle rockets don't uh, go vertical for very long, but we'll, we'll accommodate that. Um, and you're standing 40 feet from it. And so this is you right here. So it's, um, and it takes off into the air at a rate of 20 feet per second. So if this is the height of the bottle rocket, H, then dH dt is 20. 20 feet per second. All right, uh, it says find the rate at which the angle of elevation changes when the rocket is 30 feet in the air. All right, so um, there's you, you looking at the bottle rocket as it's launching. And uh, the angle of elevation in this picture is this angle right here, theta. And theta is getting bigger as the bottle rocket's launched up theta is getting bigger and so d theta dt is the rate, it, the unknown rate, that's the rate we don't know in the problem. It says find the rate, um, that uh, angle of elevation, when uh, the rocket is 30 feet in the air. So this would be when um, h is equal to 30. All right, so <clears throat> what we've got to do is we've got to write down an equation, first of all, that connects theta and h to each other. <coughs> and in this case, we have this right triangle here, and the equation that relates theta and h to each other is the tangent function. You have the tangent of theta is the opposite over adjacent, and so you have tangent of theta is equal to h over 40. And that would be the equation that relates these two uh, quantities to each other. And then what are we going to do here? We're going to differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to t. Now, if you want to, by the way, you could multiply both sides by 40. You don't need to do that, but I'll, I'll go ahead and multiply both sides by 40. And then um, what we're going to do is we're going to differentiate both sides with respect to t. The 40 is just a constant. Um, so it just comes down for the ride, and we're taking the derivative of tangent and then on the other side, we're taking the derivative of h, both with respect to t. All right, so the 40 comes down for the ride, and the derivative of tangent is secant squared. And so that'd be secant squared of theta, but now you got to be careful. You're saying that theta is some function of time here. So this is a implicit differentiation problem, and you know theta is an implied function of time. And so the this is a chain rule problem. The derivative of tangent is secant squared, uh, and so you get secant squared of theta, and then that would be times d theta dt, the derivative of the inside. The other side of the equation, we just get dh dt, like so. All right, so let's see what we've got here. Um, d theta dt is our unknown in the problem, and so we're going to solve for d theta dt. You've got this 40 secant squared here, so we divide both sides by it, and we get d theta dt is equal to um, 1 over 40 secant squared theta, like so, times dh dt. 
Now, the good thing here is the secant squared is in the denominator, and the, the reason it's a good thing is because the, co the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So a secant squared in the denominator simply means we have a cosine squared in the numerator. And so I'd rather write it that way, definitely. So you have cosine squared theta over 40 like this, and then this would be times dh dt. All right, so uh, what do you need to do here? You need to find, if we're going to substitute into this equation, we need dh dt. We have that. What we don't have is theta. We need to find theta when um, h is 30. And so we use our equation that we started with here, and we get that the um, tangent of theta is equal to 30 over 40. And so tan theta is equal to 3 fourths, like this. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, use my calculator here. And I'm going to do this in, um, I think I'm going to do this in degrees, because it kind of makes more sense to, uh, in, the, in the context of this application. I think of this as a degree problem. So I'm going to change my calculator to degrees. And then I remember what you're going to do here is you're going to find the inverse tangent of 3 fourths. So I find the inverse tangent of uh, 3 divided by 4, and I get about uh, 36.9 degrees. So theta is about, about uh, 36.9 degrees, like this. And so we're going to use theta equals 36.9 in our equation, and we're also going to use dh dt in our equation. And so d theta dt... That's the rate of change of the angle of elevation with respect to time would be the cosine squared of 36.9 uh, divided by 40 times uh, dh dt, which would be 20. And so the tw uh, let's see what we've got here. That's d theta dt. 20 over 40 is 1 half. So you have 1 half times cosine squared of 36.9 degrees is what I get. So you certainly would want to check my arithmetic on that and make sure that I, in my algebra there at the end, make sure I did all that correctly. But I'm going to take the cosine of 36.9 degrees. So I get that number, and then I'm going to square that number. And then I'm going to divide it by, and so that gives me, uh, the way I did the calculations, I got 0.639 approximately for the square of the cosine, and that would be divided by 2. And so d theta dt would be uh, that number divided by 2. So about 0.319, about 0.32, we'll say. And the units there would be, um, would be degrees per second, 0.32 degrees per second. And so that's the rate of change of uh, the angle of elevation. So about a third of a degree per second, or about a degree every three seconds would be another way to look at it. All right, and so that's a third related rate problem. Uh, definitely, I would recommend that you start walking through some of these. I'll probably work another related rate problem um, in class uh, or in lecture uh, next time out. But uh, just to kind of go back over it again, but I definitely something I would want you to be looking at and working on. Uh, you've got to work through some of these problems in order to uh, keep some of these things straight. Uh, and get uh, practice with related rate problems. So practice related rate problems, definitely, on section 4.1. Um, and then um, I would also say practice implicit differentiation um, because lots of students have trouble with implicit differentiation also. And so make sure that you go back over those sections and work some problems. Okay, that's going to be an important topic. Those are those are going to be important topics on our next exam. 
All right, and so as far as office hours, um, a couple things to mention to you here as we uh, I close down the lecture for the day. First of all, uh, I'm going to have office hours uh, tonight. So that's Wednesday uh, from 8 to 9 o'clock, 8 to 9 p.m. And then also uh, tomorrow, so this is Thursday, or that'll be Thursday from 1 to 2 p.m. And uh, one thing I'd like to, to kind of point out is that office hours from now on, uh, evening office hours, I'm going to be expanding these um, for my classes. So evening, op evening office hours are going to be, for most weeks, is going to be Sunday, 7.30 to 9, which, it's, which it has been since the beginning of the semester. But then also Monday, Tuesday, uh, let's see, I spell the word Tuesday, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday from 8 to 9 p.m. So four, four nights a week, I will be available online for help. Sundays from 7.30 to 9, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from 8 to 9. So try to take advantage of that. Come by for help when you have questions, okay? Uh, remember that homework is due this Friday. Uh, remember what I told you at the beginning of the lecture today about sending it as a single PDF and the other things that I mentioned about it. So please be getting that to me by Friday of this week. All right, uh, so uh, hopefully you have a great day. Thank you for watching the lecture. And we'll be in touch. Um, I'll be uh, hopefully getting the exams out to you or the grades out to you by the end of next week.